Thank you all. Water if you need it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for the great introduction. Uh, my name is Meg Carlson. Um, and as introduced, I am a family doctor over at South Central Foundation. And today I'm really um, going to kind of go over some of the things I see a lot in clinics. So as you kind of heard, I bridge a line between OBC medicine. Um, I also do a lot of diabetes care um, and ran a diabetes clinic in my last job um, and still see a lot of that in my own clinic. And then I also have the other hat where I do a lot of eating disorder. It seems like two separate things, but I'm going to here to show you today that it's not. These are things that are seen in all patient populations, and it's seen in our patient population um, especially. So it does exist in Alaska. That was a big thing when I came up here. People thought we don't have eating disorders, especially Alaska Natives don't get eating disorders. That's wrong. I've seen it so many times. Um, and so this is just to help bring some awareness to you and your clinic about some things you might see um, and hopefully help you find the right words um, because my goal here today is to give you something tangible you can go out with. Um, not big lofty ideas, but like what do I really say in the room? Um, so I'm going to try to keep it kind of brief um, and hopefully if you're wanting to know more, we have lots of great trainings that Akita does run. Also through my obesity side of medicine, there are also great trainings too and I've got some resources at the end for you guys to go into depth with more of those things, okay? Okay, so as kind of talked about, um, the goal today is really to help you guys um, kind of better identify eating disorders in your patient population. Majority looking at today is I'm going to focus on diabetics, but anybody um, in higher body weights too. Um, and then just some tools to help assist with that. Sorry, I can't quickly. Um, and then just also thinking about um, just the common types of ones. It's going to be pretty brief, so I'm just going to do a review for you guys really on that. Um, and as I said, encourage you to consider doing more trainings. Akita does run them. Um, and so we've got lots of online trainings you could look for in the future for that. And then just some biases on um, weight biases that we have in our clinic, in ourselves. Um, we're humans, just, you know, we're, besides wearing the hat of physician or clinician, society thinks we should think different. We come into clinic with our own biases and just recognizing those really helps you understand where you're coming from when you're entering um, into that relationship with your patient. I have no financial disclosures as discussed. I'm on the board of a few of these um, organizations that I'll be talking about at the end, but there's no fan financial um, benefit I get from any of those. Thanks. Okay, sorry. Okay, so I'm going to start with a case presentation because in my brain that works really well to think about what am I seeing in the room and then help break it down for you guys, okay? So I'm going to present a pretty common thing that I see um, a lot. Um, I, as I said, I do all ages. Um, and also, that's really important to think about all ages for disordered eating patterns. Um, so this is our 45-year-old female. She's got a past medical history for diabetes, hyperlipidemia. She's coming into your clinic. I you saw her six months ago. She was a new onset diabetic, checking back in with you today. And she said, guess what? I've started intermittently fasting. I'm tracking calories. I'm following a keto-based diet. Um, you gave her a metformin to start with. She says, yeah, I'm using it, but I've I really heard about Ozembic, and I want to talk to you more about that. Um, her BMI in your chart when you're reviewing went from 35 down to 30, and that was six months ago. And her A1C has also trended down. So she was 7.5, now her A1C is 6. And you can see some of her vitals that are below. She didn't have hypertension, um, but definitely lower than what uh, was seen before. So she says that, you know, carbohydrates, I'm, I'm really trying to avoid them. I, I don't do anything with them. I'm really strict about them. Um, I'm really just doing plant-based foods. Uh, I cook a lot, but I'm cooking for my family, but I'm, I'm not eating with them because I, I just eat by myself. Um, I don't feel hungry. I'm, I'm fasting all the, you know, for 12 hours in the day. Um, that's my, my daily fasting, and I feel great, and I'll burn off my calories if I need to. And you know she's counting, so you do ask, and she's like, oh, maybe around 1,200. So kind of pausing for a second, how do you respond to that patient? So in my, as I said, I think a lot of us, and this is not to shame anyone or think about it, because today I'm just here for education, um, and we've, I've been there too. Um, it's easy to say, congratulations, oh my gosh, you lost so much, look at your weight, it's gone down. But I want you just to pause and stop a second, and this is like my uh, other side of the brain that thinks more about what kind of weird patterns has this patient developed or disordered patterns of eating has, this, has she developed. And so I kind of put some red flags that I think about in my brain when someone talks to me about this. So intermittent fasting, great. A lot of our patients do it, um, but how often is this patient doing it and what is the purpose that she's doing it for? Um, looking at her chart, I calculate out 40 pounds she lost in the last six months. 
So kind of a lot. Um, I mean, when you just look sometimes at the BMI, you're like, oh, that BMI is still in a, an obese range technically, um, but she's lost a lot of weight um, in a brief time. And then her heart rate vitals, oh, that looks great um, for someone who's exercising a lot, really physically active, but also malnourished patients can come with a bradycardia, hypotension. Um, granted, her blood pressure is lower, but um, you know, not quite hypotensive, but makes me kind of think, right? Then she says she's avoiding carbohydrates. And that's, you know, as I said, great for our diet, you know, great, diabetes, we want to, you know, think about your carbs counting. Um, but she's really kind of extreme about it in talking about even like certain foods and beans and different things that have carbs that are hidden in it and um, really kind of going to a level that I'm getting a little more perked up about, a little worried about. Um, eating alone, also kind of a red flag. And knowing this patient, she was, she's got, you know, she really enjoys cooking. It's like what she really likes to do. Um, feeding her family was a, something that she really likes to do. And having family time um, is important to this patient. And so that just makes me think this is also a little different um, and like makes me want to kind of pause for a second. And then the burning off. Um, always what worries me when patients are talking about wanting to, to burn off calories. Um, so thinking about those kind of things. And then the not kind of letting me know exactly what. Um, and kind of being really vague about it when you know that she has talked a lot about counting calories and tracking stuff. So this brings up eating disorders. Um, this is the biggest myth of eating disorders that most of us that work in an eating disorder world would love to, to get rid of this picture. Um, this is what everyone thinks about with eating disorders. A really thin Caucasian woman that's like in her adolescence or young 20s. Um, this is a huge myth because majority of the patients that are coming to my office don't look like this and they have horrible eating disorders too. Um, eating disorders look like this. So anybody that says, you know, I treat adults or I mostly treat males, you know what, it still presents to your office too. Um, so it comes in all shapes and sizes. It comes in elderly patients I've seen. Um, so everybody unfortunately is not immune to disordered eating. And so thinking about it in everyone and not getting the blinders to think about the, that myth of what an eating disorder looks like when it's in your clinic. This is a, just a quick kind of snapshot of eating disorders in Alaska. Um, we have a handout actually over at Akita for this. Um, the problem with our numbers for our state and really across the country is it's an underdiagnosed disease, so we know that we are missing a lot. Um, but on average, is about 9% of the population that will develop an eating disorder. So 64,000 people, that's 65,000 people um, in our state. So it is in our state. It has a lot of cost um, to society as well. Um, so there are big impacts to, to disorders. So going through just some of these, and I said, this is going to be just a really brief overview. Um, I encourage you to consider more, but this is just to be a good reminder for those that have already done some training in this too. Um, what is anorexia nervosa? That is that restriction of energy. Um, so I highlighted the, the main things that you should think about, that fear of becoming fat and uh, or gaining weight. And I kind of highlight that um, even though, as I said, because some of this might not be that they're completely underweight, but just that fear, intense fear of weight gain. Um, and then just in disturbance in how you see your body too. That's, that's hallmark, the big hallmarks of what makes anorexia. I highlight atypical anorexia because we are seeing this more often. It is not just in patients uh, that have a BMI that is you know, very low. It is in patients that have a normal BMI that also have anorexia. So that's people that meet that criteria, but they're not underweight despite losing significant amounts of weight. So these are just you know, the warning signs I put on the side for you just to reference back, but really just I get you know, that fear. It's an intense fear in a patient that they'll have about weight gain or re regain, and then that restriction of energy um, is really those big hallmarks for a patient that's in your office that you want to think about anorexia. So that wanting to burn off that fear, that wanting to not gain anything, um, and really getting scared when you talk about having to have, you know, eat more or having anything like that. Those things could per should perk you up to maybe a, a disorder there. Bulimia nervosa, I think, is another one that commonly uh, most of us think about. Um, that's when they were, you eat a large amount in one time, and then there's that sense of out of control. And then you want to have that compensatory behavior. I think the, the trick that I see a lot of people that uh, kind of get stumbled on this, that I'll see the diagnosis that's been missed, is because they're not vomiting, they're doing other things. And so you just, they might say, oh, they don't have it. Um, because they're not vomiting, but actually they're taking laxatives um, or they're excessively exercising. Um, so they're doing something or they're fasting for days after they eat. Um, they, they're still doing something to compensate for eating like that. So 
That's, and that's another thing where their self-evaluation, their self-evaluation's also changed, and it's really influenced by what they look like, too. So as I said, there's the same thing. It's just that eating a large amount followed by compensatory behavior is what uh, that bulimia one, and there's a bunch of those warning signs, um, things that you can go back through, uh, but those are eating different kind of strange foods, different things, too, that can be um, just things that you should perk yourself up to. Um, Binge eating disorder is actually the most common eating disorder and probably the least known eating disorder for many clinicians. Um, so binge eating disorder is eating, so similar it looks like to uh, bulimia, except we don't have the compensatory behavior. But it's really associated with feeling really bad about yourself afterwards. Feeling full, feeling like uncomfortable, um, and then just feeling like you're out of control and you're distressed. So patients that come to me, um, I've had quite a bit. Uh, most commonly I see this in my practice and it's that they're feeling, they, they eat a lot and then they feel guilty and distressed and horrible and then that cycle goes on, on again. Um, and so that's going on at least once a week for three months to meet the criteria. Uh, but remembering with eating disorders that sometimes you can have disordered eating and you might not meet a criteria. Um, we have these in-betweens too. So these are that to kind of uh, specify those. So there's a lot of ones that quite don't meet the criteria. ARFID is another one that's um, one that will start, we, I've seen um, a little bit more recently in our population. Um, this is where they're having issues, and a lot of this can come from prior childhood issues, uh, neglect coming from different homes uh, where food was scarce, so they might develop these patterns. Um, it's not really about body shape and image, but they're still developing disordered eating patterns that are affecting them daily. And then, as I said, some of these other atypical anorexia, um, purging disorder, night eating syndrome, or some of the other things. Um, so some screening tools. As I said, I wanted to give you some things that today you could be like, what am I going to do? Um, here are some things um, that kind of can help. So most of them are pretty basic. Um, SCOF is a questionnaire that's been uh, well val validated to look for anorexia and bulimia. Um, if you score two or more, higher risk of having that disorder. Um, in most studies, it's close to 80, 89% um, positivity. Um, so that's it. Do you make yourself sick uh, when you're uncomfortably full? Um, do you worry that you've lost control over how much you eat? Have you lost more than, so this was created in the UK, so it's one, pound, uh, one stone, uh, which is 14 to 15 pounds roughly in the last three months. And do you think that you're fat when others think that you're thin? Um, and would you say that food dominates your life? So if they answer yet to, you know, to two of those, um, that's just a high probability that they might have an eating disorder. There's the eating disorder screening for primary care, which is another one, um, which is a little bit, I think some of these might be a little easier to ask patients than sometimes the scoff, uh, which is, are you satisfied with your eating patterns? Like pretty open-ended. Um, no uh, is considered abnormal for that. Um, do you eat in secret? Uh, does your weight affect the way you feel about yourself? Have any members of your family suffered with an eating disorder? And are you currently suffering or have you ever suffered with an eating disorder? I think these are really helpful um, things to talk about, especially in our patients that we're dealing with other medical uh, problems, especially you know, your diabetic patients um, or treating your you know, obesity management patients if you're doing that, which a lot more now are, are doing. Because um, that is really helpful to kind of know what you need to be careful about. So if your patient does say, yes, I have had an eating disorder before, um, those are the patients you want to think more about because if it's, you know, they're at more risk for that recurring. So two or more of that is a positive screener for, um, for your patient. And then this is a binge eating disorder screener. It's pretty simple. It's just two questions, which always is easier to do in clinic when we just have two things to do. Um, and it really just asks, during the last three months, have you been worried about, like, have any episodes of excessive overeating? Um, and that's either a yes or no, and if it's a yes or no, then how do you feel? Do you feel distressed about this, yes or no? Um, and then it would get more in detail if you respond yes or no to those two questions, um, that it goes down deeper. So it's a great questionnaire that you could give someone um, to start off a visit, um, especially um, if there's any concerns about that. As I said, binge eating disorder is one that I'm seeing more in my, um, actually in my diabetic population, but also when um, coming to talk to us about obesity management, um, this is one that we definitely want to make sure we're screening for. So going back to our case, um, does our patient have a dis eating disorder? And how are, as that question at the end, how are we going to respond? Um, so I think a big thing with those red flags that I brought up, um, and 
This is also where it's knowing your patient too, but you might not know this patient that well. So even if I don't know her, and this is the first time I've met her, with those things that she asked, best thing to do, and that won't create any harm, and ways to talk about this um, without, is just asking open-ended questions. So, you know, I'd say like with all of these changes that you've recently made, I wonder how are you, how are you actually feeling? And that's a great open-ended thing where she can respond to, you know, actually I've been feeling really stressed and there's, a, you know, a lot going on in my life and there's other stuff because it's not usually just the eating, right? There's other things that are happening that, um, that precipitate these disorders. Um, and then another great question that can kind of start to ask some of those tools, those tool questions that you have. Um, do you feel like food is dominating your life? And that's something that, you know, really can then, is that these are open-ended things where they can kind of present back to you. And she's like, yeah, actually, no, I'm really, I think about it a lot. And she starts to get a little teary-eyed as she's talking about that. And then, do you, feel, do you feel worried about your size? Or do you feel hopeless about your body? Or how do you feel about your body? And those are also questions that are just really open-ended and not placing any blame or talking about weight um, or creating any more um, you know, stigma to anything that might be going on. And so she asks, asks, says that she doesn't feel great about how she looks or how she feels, um, and her weight is starting to bother. Like, she doesn't feel like she's at a good weight. She feels uncomfortable in her body. So she scores her scoff of three because um, she's also lost more than one stone over three months too. So positive for eating disorders. So what am I doing next with that? Um, so a lot of times this is not going into the full presentation of treatment and everything else today. Um, but the next thing I would just say would be I'd avoid talking about fixating on congratulating on her A1C or numbers because that just feeds disordered eating patterns, right? So you want to say, you know, I really have some concerns and I really hope that we can like, you know, maybe meet with one of our counselors or a dietitian just to you know talk more about these things and really avoiding going you know to congratulate anything disordered eating and eating disorders feed off of reward and a lot of uh, studies show that clinicians and providers and physicians when they say oh you have great labs or this it just actually strengthens the eating disorder which makes treatment harder um, so that's always something you just want to make sure we are not creating we said that Treating your disease without creating harm is sometimes knowing when not to go into those things, when to walk away from that um, and focus on now, you know, her eating disorder has a higher risk than her uh, diabetes right now for being more life-threatening for her life. So, so this is going to kind of transition us into more of like that weight stigma. Um, so weight stigma is all around us, right? Um, if you're a human and you have social media or you listen to the news or you go on anything, uh, there is that constant stigma of, you know, people on social media, you know, the news, everything telling you what you should and shouldn't look like. Um, so being somebody overweight or obese, there's those messages of that you're lazy, you don't have any willpower, uh, you know, you not, your, your moral character is somehow uh, lower because of your size, your hygiene is affected because of your size. You're not as intelligent. Um, studies have shown people feel lower levels of intelligent with people that have ob obesity or, or overweight um, and attractiveness. So there's just all this messaging. So knowing that when we're coming into the room, there's all these things that our patients are being bombarded with, especially when they're living in a higher body weight. Weight stigma, especially is bad in medicine. Uh, we do know that over, and this is one study, but there are many other studies out there that show this, um, that over 50% of patients that are overweight or obese have, may, have had inappropriate comments made by their providers. Um, and also there was other studies that looked at nurses um, in the hospital um, looking at weight and feeling like they don't want to take care of patients. Over 30% to 40% responded they wouldn't want to take care of a patient of a higher body mass. So there, there are these things and these are stigmas and as I said, we're humans, right? So just because you're a physician or a clinician in any capacity, we still come to this with all these other stigmas that we've heard ourselves in society and that we come in with. So really just being aware of that yourself. There is a great test um, that you can do to test yourself um, that does do this implicit bias testing. So it takes about 10 minutes to do. Um, so I, I didn't quite have time to do it with everyone today, but it is a great thing. Um, I include the link here for you to do. The first time I did this was back at a conference like six years ago when I started uh, obesity medicine training, um, and it really was shocking because it's, it asked you to, to quickly make judgments, right? 
and it's, set, it's in the back of our head and we don't even realize it. But doing that test and then repeating it now six years later, um, I've, it's definitely changed for me um, where I've re there's been those aha moments that I'm no longer, I feel like, judging as much as I did in the beginning because of a lot of my training, a lot of what I now know too about obesity. Um, our physical environment is stigmatizing. So think about your chairs in your room, you know, how uncomfortable is it for your patient that doesn't quite fit in them? And what are we telling our patients then that like, oh, I don't have a gown the right size for you. I can't actually check your blood pressure. Um, so definitely thinking about the physical environment and then uh, sometimes we can change that um, and or just advocating for change of those things because who wants to come in to get in? Most patients with obesity don't seek care um, or higher body weights are not coming in to seek care because of those things. They don't want to feel shamed. Uh, they don't like to have to be weighed. Um, so, you know, not always weighing your patient or asking if they want to be weighed. Um, things like that can really be helpful to making it easier when you're in the room with them to have open conversations about weight. So finding the right words. Um, so this is when you're talking to a patient and as I said, that higher body weight, we want to use, and a lot of this comes from the obesity medicine um, kind of teachings that are out there now, and if I know there's a lot of obesity medicine training, and I know in the past there's been uh, conferences um, at this conference too about obesity medicine, but this is where you want to use people first language, which is not saying you have obesity, it's you know like talking about it as it's actually a medical condition and we are not going to just label people. Um, so staying away from you know, words that are judgmental um, and just focus on their size and not them as a human. Um, so being open, non-judgmental. So many of my patients that I take care of have, you know, comment that, well, the first thing that the last physician told me was that I just had to like exercise more or my diabetes would be more under control if I just like could control my food intake more. And there's all these things that people just throw out without actually knowing what's actually going on with their patient. So really going in open-minded, um, and are you know really changing that mantra for our patient that they can feel that you're in partnership with them and you're not there to judge them. Um, and really, I, what I do because how everyone asks me how am I doing obesity medicine, helping people with that when I'm trying to help with you know doing eating disorder care too. Really, what I focus on with any of my obesity management patients is really not focusing on weight. I take the emphasis off the weight. I really focus it on their health. How are you feeling? How does moving your body feel? What are you proud of that you're doing that you couldn't do before? Less on the weight, more about health. We all know that we don't need to lose that much body weight to control our diabetes or control chronic health diseases. We really want to remind our patients that too. This is about long-term health goals, prevention, not creating diseases, right? Um, and not trying to live up to a standard that's not possible too. Uh, and never assume, as I said, always ask history, um, always asking about what have you tried that has worked or hasn't worked before we start to just go right in and start to tell them, well, you need to eliminate this and that um, and totally change your life. Like really knowing your patient um, and really kind of figuring out where they've been and how we could help them go f to the next step. Um, and remind you of just the complexity of the weight. Um, this is the worst thing that medicine has ever said and continues to say still though is eat less, exercise more. Uh, that is way too simple. We know that doesn't work. Um, there is tons of data and research that came out of the bariatric world that has shown that it's you know metabolic changes that are actually fueling some of these uh, you know weight changes that we're seeing. Um, so this is just a, a quick little thing. I don't have enough time to go into the whole like obesity cycle, but we know this is a big complex cycle. There's genetic environmental factors. Placing blame just on the person is really not helping the big situation and not helping our patient because in the end they just feel defeated and guilty. Um, so just kind of thinking of it big picture, reminding your patient too when they're feeling defeated that this is a bigger thing. So these are some of the resources um, that I have. Um, so these are a couple of the eating disorder associations as well as obesity medicine associations that are great. Um, a lot of the resources that I pulled from for my talk come from them. Um, and they're just great resources for you um, if you want to know more, get more information. Um, great places for you to start. Um, and then, as I said, a lot of them hold trainings on. Great thing is with the pandemic, most of the things have gone online. Um, so there's a lot of trainings online for um, to just learn more about, as I said, kind of this intersection of treating chronic disease um, in, a, in a way that's just gonna be helpful to our patient and more thinking about patient first language. And that is it. I tried to kind of end early so I'd have some time for questions, so.
Do we have any questions? Oh, thank you. You got it. Yeah, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, this, I think, is a topic that is, is really challenging to address um, as a dietitian who works in diabetes, particularly because of the ADA standard five, like all of section five. I think that they're slowly trying to implement changes regarding like behavior change and healthy lifestyle choices. But if you get into that section, everything is focused on weight loss mm -hmm. and this like calorie deficit to be achieved. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to maybe things that might be coming with like more research and recommendation updates? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, a lot of this is coming out of that the more data that we're getting and, you know, really the explosion of, you know, all these medications that have been great because they actually, you know, the GLPs have shown that like, hey, there is a, a deeper biology to this, you know, th these things are hitting triggers and why did bariatric surgery work is because metabolically it changes things, not just because we cut the weight out, right? Because we know that that doesn't just work alone. Um, so I think it's changing that thought in medicine, which is really slow to change though, is that mantra of that there's something deeper going on, right? It's not just that. There's also stuff in our environment that we know hormonally changes stuff too. So um, I think more focus on, you know, as I said, the, that like deeper pathophysiology that's going on um, and remembering that your patient doesn't have full control of that, right? They can't control the receptors, you know, in their hypothalamus that regulate what, you know, the downscaling of what's happening with how you regulate fat. Um, so there's, you know, that, that deeper thing. So I do think, you know, medication management, I do a lot of, you know, um, because a lot of it, I tell my patients that, you know, this is stuff that we can't just overcome because this is your biology too, right? There's a reason why, you know, just like diabetes, like you're genetically, you have this, not just because of what you ate, right? You have this because of a deeper biology of what's happening in your pancreas and other, you know, with your cells and your resistance going on. Uh, we can modulate that with food, but then longer term, we also just know that, you know, there's, there's more to it than just, it's not that simple as just not eating. And I do think, you know, I'm not saying that we can't recommend diet changes. Um, it's just re recognizing when it's becoming a problem in our patient and what patients well, maybe we don't want to recommend that for, right? Patients that have that history or family history, 30% of people that have a family history of eating disorders will develop one themselves. Um, also significant trauma history is much more higher risk for binge eating disorder. So thinking about your patient and where they've come from before you start to recommend any kind of uh, significant changes to what they're eating. Staying away from the word diet. We know that diet is triggering um, and also, you know, it's not like long term, right? This is lifestyle changes, long term changes that we're hoping a patient can not just stay with for, you know, six months. We're hoping that we can make changes long term. And from all studies show that, you know, if we try to do these rapid weight loss diets, um, they don't maintain. Because what happens is that internally you're getting elevated ghrelin levels that are going to make, you know, and all these, you know, hormonal levels that are regulating weight in their body much higher than somebody at a normal body weight trying to do the same thing. So your patients, when they're saying they're start, you know, they're, they're having these things, it is much harder for a patient coming from a different body weight to lose weight than it is for someone at a normal weight. Um, there's just the pathophysiology behind that. So just recognizing those, I think, you know, the, the future is, I think a lot of these recommendations will change, especially because the world of endocrinology has finally accepted, which, I mean, obesity medicine came out from uh, the same world, right? Um, it is more now mainstream. This six years ago when I was starting to look in the realm of um, doing obesity medicine, I was really skeptical and I was like, I'm only gonna do this if there's evidence-based treatment for this because I see a bunch of you know, weight loss clinics and that's, that's exactly wrong. So, um, but it is really, you know, just from six years ago to now, it's now really standard of care almost. Um, and it's m much more understood that uh, you know, obesity management is not just eat less and you know, exercise more. There's a bigger pathophysiology behind that and that, that's where medications are more helpful and small amounts of change is what we're looking at for long term to make people healthy. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, um, how many of your patients do you screen for eating disorder? 
So I screen every one of my patients. Um, and it's, in, it's not a formal screening, but it's just in the way that I ask the questions. So any patient that I do um, that specifically is coming for weight management for me, I am I'm definitely, I'm screening them. Um, and most of that is just asking these like open-ended questions about what, what their relationship is with food. Um, and that's how I started. So my first appointments for anybody that comes to me for uh, weight management specifically is about 45 minutes so that we can just get to know where they've been and their history um, before I talk about anything else. Um, so I screen everyone because everyone, and I do it again when I see them back too, uh, because things can develop in the interim. Um, I think a great example is a patient, and I even, as I said, I'm not perfect, and I, that's why I'm saying sometimes the words are not right, and I don't always say the right thing too. It's just having that awareness. Um, I've had a perfect example of recently of like a 25-year-old patient that I had with PCOS that um, was overweight and wanted to get pregnant. And so we were helping with dietary recommendations, changes to help with that goal of pregnancy. And I saw her back six months later and she had lost 60 pounds. And she was miserable and crying in my office and had intense fear of eating. Um, so even despite me thinking about it, I, and I was, it was constantly in my head at the beginning because she has a history of depression, anxiety, trauma, um, so we were there and it still happened, but the great thing is at least when I saw it, I was able to, we were able to recognize, get treatment, um, and start her um, back on track. Uh, because early recognition of eating disorders is super important, just like any disorder, if we can catch it early, we can make sure treatment is much you know, easier than long term where it's much harder to kind of start to pull that eating disorder thinking away from your patient. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the DLP ones when you use those. I mm -hmm. mean, because we're hearing so many of our patients, you know, are being put on them mm -hmm. and um, for weight loss. And then sometimes it's 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 like there's it's supposed to be for short term. And how does that work? And yeah, so you know. it's never for. I'll say. Uh, it's never for short term. It's never supposed to be for short term. So if you're following obesity medicine, um, like true guidelines, we know that these are these are hormone replacement, right? So GLP is a hormone that we're replacing, and unfortunately, it, once we replace it and it works, it doesn't stay or change your system. So it's not like our SSRIs where we can you know withdraw them after six months and then depression maybe will stay um, because we've changed those hormones. This is not the same way. Um, so no obesity medicine drug is for short term. So if you're doing obesity medicine, and most people that are well trained in this should know that, that this is what you should counsel your patient on. This is, if we see benefit, unfortunately, wrapping your head around this, it's, it's long term things um, that we have to, we have to continue. Because unfortunately, what we are recognizing is that these pathways are damaged and then we cannot fix them permanently. Um, so it is long term, which is hard for a patient that is younger, for a female that's reproductive age. So really taking that into consideration before starting like medical therapy sometimes um, is what I, I talk a lot about my patients about. That, you know, it's unfortunately very publicized right now, um, but there's just more complexity to it than go on it, lose weight, and then go, you're gonna weight regain again. And then uh, that can also, as I said, just impact, you know, kind of their mental health too about that. So I'd say just, you know, really thinking of obesity as a chronic condition is probably the best way I've been able to kind of help patients understand that this is not something that, that you, it's, you know, it's unfortunately a lot of different factors that create obesity. And how do we just help with starting to make some changes, you know, for how they feel about themselves? Because I find a lot of times when we start to help with that piece, it makes a lot of the other things get better too. Um, so, yeah, but Ozempic is not a quick fix. It's great for the right patient. Um, and it does help with that hormone replacement and those metabolic changes that are going on. But definitely not for short term. That's what's happening, I do know. I'm very aware of what's happening in the community. Yep, and I hear it from patients when they come to talk to me too and they just want a med. Um, that's also something that perks me up when they come in just demanding like, I need to have this. And you know, I really try to step back and see what are, why is this so important right now? What is really driving this like urgent concern for you to go on this medication? Because a lot of times it's probably something else, right? Um, so. And if it's, you know, that they truly are diabetic and it's helping their diabetes, that's great. But if it's something more of 
I feel horrible about myself, I hate the way I look, I can't handle what I, how I feel, um, then I really don't want to just feed into that um, because that's unfortunately what you will be doing. And that's the hardest thing when I have other clinicians coming up to me asking me about patients in demanding this medication, and I really think they have an eating disorder. Giving them a medication to create weight loss at that point is just going to feed into the disorder. And it's super hard to be in the room and tell somebody no for that and that we really need to get other help. Um, but that is the best thing you can do for them. Thank you. Uh, so I do have a number of patients with eating disorders. Uh, mm -hmm. So I uh, want to ask you, what is your um, strategies for treatment of those disorders uh, as a primary care? So that is like a whole talk. I, I, know, I know, just maybe uh, just briefly, because there is maybe something else I can do. Just like I want to pick up your brain and see what else can I yeah. add. So that is hard, because it, it is literally a whole other talk that I have. Um, done before, and uh, I'd say stay tuned for part two. Uh, there is great, so Akita resources are out there. We have a lot of, uh, right now there's an ECHO going on. Uh, that's a, if you're not familiar with ECHO, it's the um, training that we do where we bring specialists um, in from out of state, and we have a panel of experts in state, and it's online, and it's going on right now. Um, I think our next session is early October, or in a week or two, um, but that helps. And we also record the sessions too. And exactly that is what we're targeting. We are trying to help with people in the community in Alaska, how do we get eating disorder treatment? Um, how do we help our patients um, when we have limited resources? That's what this whole series focuses on. Um, I'm not an eating disorder specialist by any means. I'm more, as a, I consider myself eating disorder informed clinician and I can do some treatment, but I am not super experienced. So we bring in some of the experts to help um, kind of go through cases with us um, through the ECHO platform, which is run by the uh, UAA. So um, if you stop by our booth outside, I, we do have some information about that ECHO series. It's online too on Akita. You just have to register for it. Um, but it's great because it's also open forum, so you can ask questions to the experts as well. Um, so I would defer that to uh, just because it's a, a longer talk about what we do, and, and we can actually talk about specific cases. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, thank you guys so very much. I really appreciate you allowing me to come to talk with you today.